Join me in today's responsive reading. When the world knows beauty as beauty, there is ugliness. When the world knows good as good, then there is evil. In this way, existence and non-existence produce each other. Difficult and easy complete each other. Long and short contrast each other. High and low attract each other. Pitch and tone harmonize each other. Future and past follow each other. Therefore, enlightened people hold their position without effort, practice their philosophy without words, are a part of all things, and overlook nothing. They produce, but do not possess, act without expectation, succeed without taking credit. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Fountain Street, where you can free the mind, grow your soul, and change the world. We are glad you chose to join us today. My name is Liza Ingerham, and I am the new Volunteer Ministries Coordinator. I'm stepping into an important and historical space for those that have come before me in this position, from our beloved Paula Rollins, who I had the privilege of meeting my first week here in July, and have continued contact with Jenny Kenny, who was my predecessor. I come from a family that valued volunteerism from serving in our family church to my grandpa, who went every week to the Granville Historical Society until he wasn't able to serve anymore. I was encouraged at an early age to serve and volunteer. One of the reasons I was so attracted to this position in the first place was the immense amount of culture and legacy that Fountain Street Church has for serving the Grand Rapids community. During my first year of serving as an AmeriCorps member, I worked at an at-risk youth center that encouraged civic, civic engagement regularly and was utilized as a tool to support learning and growth for the kids. Fast forward to my last position, I worked as a graduate assistant for an associate professor at the social, School of Social Work at Grand Valley State University. And we created a program that utilized service learning as um, a part of the learning process. Not surprisingly, my colleagues in the program told me how it enriched, enriched their knowledge of the concepts they were learning as well as provided them with a tactile learning space to get their hands dirty. I come here to Fountain Street Church with that same space of supporting building community by serving and giving back, as well as providing spaces for people to heal and grow. I'm excited for the coming church year to learn from the legacy that is Fountain Street Church and to help encourage building authentic growth through our volunteer opportunities. Speaking of which, if you don't know your district leader or uh, don't even know what a district is, please find me after the service and I will guide you to them. I leave you with one of my favorite quotes by a great inspirational leader and man. Everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. By Martin Luther King Jr. Namaste.
Welcome. I'm Susan Printy. I'm, I'm so happy that, that you're here today and that I have this opportunity to um, share some ideas about leadership. Ooh. I'm going to start, though, just with the, pro with the order of service. Um, it says a university of possibility. Uh, actually, I'm talking today about a universe of possibility, but I am from MSU, and we are a university of possibility. <laughs> So how marvelous, you know? Um, what a wonderful addition to my, uh, my talk today. I have the pleasure of teaching graduate students who are preparing to be educational leaders in my work at Michigan State University. Whether they are working at the school district level as superintendents or curriculum directors, at the school level as principals, or close to their classrooms as teacher leaders, my students are dedicated to the children of Michigan, and they want to be the best professionals possible. I remind them frequently that they are undertaking courageous work. I find it extremely enjoyable to, ch to help them challenge their own assumptions and stretch their imaginations. And our interactions always leaving, leave me with wanting to be just a little bit better. You all know that educators are under intense scrutiny and pressure to raise the level of achievement of their students that they have in their care. And they need to accomplish ever more with ever fewer resources. They need to equalize learning regardless of students' social or economic backgrounds. They need to provide differentiated yet challenging learning environments. They need to address students' emotional and health needs. And they need to ensure that every child is known and cared for by at least one adult member of the school. Oh, and then there's school improvement, teacher evaluation, curriculum alignment, professional development, and snow days, and fiscal emergencies, and bus accidents, and much worse. Every day, educators go to school to face the complexity I've only hinted at. They're sorely in need of ways to reframe their work and the world around them. Today I want to just share a few lessons or practices that help orient them and I hope might nudge you toward a university. Sorry, a universe of possibility. <laughs> I really am not here on a recruitment trip, but <laughs> okay. I need to lay just a bit of foundation. As I prepared this talk, 
I had to kind of crystallize what I wanted to say about faith. And as Fountain Streeters, this is just the kind of thing we're encouraged to do. As you're accustomed to in the summer services, this is anything but a theological treatise. Also, though I'm a professor, this talk is not a footnoted lecture. Though, I will provide a few readings for you in the printed uh, copy. To begin, I am a person with strong faith. I have faith in myself and faith in that things will turn out okay. I have faith in people generally and I operate from the conviction that when conditions are supportive, people will do the right thing more often than not. I have faith that the universe will provide what's needed to accomplish what I or others want to do. For me, the universe is the source of all. In my own experience and in my faith, I believe the universe offers gifts in abundance to those who are mindful, who are flexible, and who are ready to receive them. In that last sentence, I make the point that I need to be in the right frame of mind and spirit, however, to benefit from the gifts that the universe provides. I need to be willing to embrace possibility in how I receive information and how I respond. In no way do I encourage a simple ask and you shall receive. True. Sometimes I say to a student, or to my daughter, or to my friend, or to myself, send your request out to the universe. But what I really mean is, with this request, ready yourself to receive what the universe offers, though it might not at all be what you thought you needed. Be mindful. Bring every sense to an awareness of what might come from the current situation. Be flexible and willing to consider alternate paths. And be open to inspiration and new connections and to the heights of your own potential. And none of that is easy or natural to do when we're under stress in the middle of a problematic situation that would benefit from the universe's gifts. So here are three lessons or practices that I encourage my students to cultivate to heighten their mindfulness, increase their flexibility, and draw them away from fear toward openness and trust. As you listen, I'd like you to imagine you're the principal of a school. Practice one, step beyond measurement. As an educator, I've given my shares of B's and C's and D's, grades that often put the greater emphasis on what's wrong and end up discouraging students from, from taking risks in their learning. Currently in Michigan, schools are ranked top to bottom according to students' scores on standardized tests, which are measures taken at a single point in time during the year, regardless of the challenges students bring with them into the schoolyard. Schools must now measure with those same tests the value that teachers add to students' learning a practice that often demoralizes teachers because there's no recognition of all the gains their students have made outside of one test. As I have framed this accounting, you'd be unable to locate any sense of infinite possibility or of generative abundance. School leaders cannot ignore the metrics that shape the environments of their professional lives, but they do not have to be defined or dominated by them. The practice I encourage is to recognize that there's a universe of possibility beyond these measures. If leaders can shake themselves free of the assumptions of scarcity and then stand open in harmony with the universe and passionate about the work they, in which they engage, they're more likely to attract the resources they need. When they're oriented toward abundance and passion, um, they will draw others along with their resources to their projects. Now here's a distinction to ponder. In the measurement world, the leader sets a goal and all work toward it. A school might take up test prep, for instance, as a strategy to achieve the goal of higher test scores. But a steady diet of test prep is really deadening to students. In the world of possibility, the leader establishes a context 
and then participates with others as the future unfolds. Lively and engaging learning environments and trusting personal relationships have the potential for riches far beyond belief for the adults and the children in that school. Here's practice number two. Look for possibility in a problem. As humans, we've been conditioned to think in terms of dualities, either this or that. Often, as I've previously noted, in terms of winners and losers. In my study of schools, I've come to understand that there are tensions endemic to organizational life, no matter how effective or dynamic the leader. Schools receive mandates to change to a new set of standards, no matter that they've just figured out the old ones. New processes for teacher evaluation, remember those value-added scores, have the unintended consequence of dismantling teacher uh, professional collaboration among teachers. So teachers are less willing to share their materials or their plans when they know they're going to be rated and ranked. So a principal could decide to champion the new standards or she could protect her teachers from the pressure to change. A principal could determine to rigorously implement a new teacher evaluation process and rank teachers top to bottom. Or he could merely comply with the process and give all his teachers an effective rating in order to maintain their professional trust. We tend to think in those dualities. School leaders can be pushed one way or the other by tensions, or they can capitalize on the possibility that exists within the opposite positions. This practice starts with a recognition that each end of the tension contains a valued position. Consider on the one hand, an evaluation system that seeks to identify teachers who are effective in helping students learn. Well, sounds like a good thing. Consider on the other hand, Teachers become better collectively when they collaborate with each other. Sounds like a good thing. But the way things are operating, those often are intention. Here's the distinction to consider. A skillful leader takes what many consider to be opposite conditions, integrates them, and creates a new approach to the situation that emphasizes both goods. Recognizing both the value of achievement results and the value of collaboration, a principal might establish an agenda to support value-added collaboration, where teachers with high performance collaborate with their colleagues to share their instructional practices and where all teachers engage in valid, valid evaluation processes to understand their own skill sets. Ranking and competition are missing here, and possibility prevails. And here's my final practice. Invest in others. In the universe of possibility, relationships among people are highlighted. While I just spoke of the power of collaborative work among teachers, here I wish to emphasize the personal relationship between two individuals. This practice might apply to a principal and a teacher, to a teacher and a student, to a wife and a husband. When I say to invest in others, I don't mean to provide them with experience that's going to bring them up to a certain standard, not measuring, Rather, I use the term investment to suggest a willingness to give the other person your time and attention and to operate from a perspective of respect such that the other person has room to realize herself. My research about school leadership shows that instruction is better and students learn more in schools where principals share leadership with others, with teachers. 
broadly. A principal who invests in teachers' leadership brings teachers alongside the principal under common purpose and invites their participation to make a difference in their school. This invitation lays the groundwork for qualitatively different conversations. Because of the investment, the principal is open to hearing different perspectives from teacher leaders. Because of the investment, the principal is more willing to speak the truth to them. Through shared leadership, each and all are transported into the universe of possibility. And doesn't this echo nicely Elizabeth's comment about the ripple effect? What goes to teachers is spread through teachers and works also in classrooms, in schools, and goes out into the community through parents and families. So investing in others um, starts that ripple effect. Here's the distinction I really want you to think about in terms of investing. It's not at all an activity demanding an accounting or a keeping track. The leader gives power away to his teachers who because of their experiences with the principal replicate the same kind of relationships with other teachers. Throughout the school, teachers are leaders who invest in others and in so doing, invite them to consider possibility. Thank you for entering this world of school leadership. But I'm not just talking about principles. These practices are for you. When you find yourself fearful that you're losing, stop. Shift your attention to that world of abundance just beyond your reach. When you find yourself facing a familiar dichotomy, an either or, search instead for a both and solution by integrating the best of both options. Finally, when you know that people are your solution, open yourself to them authentically, ready to listen and to speak honestly. Look around you. Possibility is everywhere. Thank you. <laughs>